All right, there's three restarts in the game of basketball. The jump ball, the throw-in, and free throws. Today, we're going to look at play scenarios involving restarts. Let's get started. Stick around. Greetings and welcome back to the Basketball Rules Expert. We're here to keep our, our saw sharp, as it were. National Federation of High School Basketball Rules, staying connected with the rules, fleshing out the areas where we're inconsistent, and sharpening our saw. Let's get started today and look at our very first play scenario. During the jump ball to start overtime, jumper A1 bats the toss, which caroms off the tossing official's head high into the air. A1 then jumps and catches the ball before it touches the floor. The officials rule this to be a jump ball violation. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? It's not something you see every day. We do see on jump balls players oftentimes swinging hard. Sounds like in this instance they contacted the ball. The ball bounces off the official's head high up into the air. The ball's still live. Our jumper jumps up, grabs the ball. The officials rule a violation. We know that a jumper cannot grab a jump ball before the jump ball ends, right? It's very logical for the official would have a, a whistle on a play like this. But with the restarts in the game of basketball, it's important to understand that they are a special set of rules and restrictions, but those only apply during the restart. So when does a jump ball start? When does a jump ball end? Did that during that period between the start and the end, did something illegal occur? That's what we need to understand with the restarts because, again, they're only a special set of rules that only applies for a limited amount of time, and in that time could be very brief. So a jump ball begins when the official, the tossing official, releases the ball. That's when the jump ball restrictions start, and when the, when the jump ball ends, those restrictions are no longer in place. By rule, when the ball, a jumper... Uh, the ball contacts the floor, an official, or either basket, at that point, at that moment, the jump ball has ended. So in this instance, when the ball contacted the official, at that moment, the jump ball had ended, the restrictions had ended on that play. So in this instance, where the officials ruled a violation when actually the jump ball had ended, were the officials correct? Yes or no? No. No, they were not. This is a legal play by rule. Jump ball and jump ball restrictions had ended on this play, and this should, should be ruled a legal play by our officials. All right, let's take a look at our next play scenario. As the referee is on the upward motion to release the toss, A2, near the sideline, in a designed play, sprints towards their goal in anticipation of receiving a pass after the tip. The officials ruled a jump ball violation for the player moving prior to the release of the toss. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Okay, there's restrictions on non-jumpers, right? So this team has a play that's designed for a, a player to release towards the goal, probably a tap to a teammate, and then a throw ahead to that player. So uh, just as they're on their upward motion, so the ball, the ball hasn't even been released, and that player leaves the spot on the floor that they were at, runs towards their goal, the officials rule a violation on the player moving prior to the toss, right? Jump balls are not the most frequent occurrence, a restart in the game of basketball, right? They happen about 1.05 times per game on average. Occasionally we'll have a second jump ball for an overtime, but they don't happen frequently. 
Understanding the restrictions on jumpers and the restrictions on non-jumpers are the things that we have to understand uh, when it comes to adjudicating plays on jump balls. Now, it's an area that maybe we don't focus on, and so we're unsure, etc. It's important to understand that non-jumpers who are not on the center restraining circle, and by on the center restraining circle, meaning they are within three feet of the center circle, those players are on, they have a separate set of restrictions. Players who are not on the center circle, there is no restriction whatsoever. They can run around in circles, they can stand on their head, they can do jumping jacks, they can do push-ups, they can run back and forth, um, waving their hands like they just don't care. There's no restrictions on those players. Sometimes officials, as they approach to uh, initiate a jump ball, will tell players who are not on the center of the circle to you know, adjust themselves so that they're side by side, right? But there's no restriction on those players. Important to understand that. So in this situation where the officials ruled a jump ball violation for the player moving prior to the toss, were the officials correct? Yes or no? No. No, they were not. There's no restriction on these players. This would be a fixable scenario. The crew could come and get this and make things right. All right, two jump ball plays in. Let's look at another jump ball scenario. On the jump ball to start the game, A1 bats the ball backwards, where A5 and B5 both simultaneously control the ball, resulting in a held ball ruling. The officials rule there will be another jump ball with A5 and B5 as the jumpers. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? So we got two jumpers. They go up. They bat the ball. Two other players on the court, two opponents of each other, both grab the ball and gain simultaneous control of the ball. The officials rule a jump ball in this instance, right? We often use the language held ball, but we're ruling a jump ball in this instance. Who will perform the subsequent jump ball? Now, I know that there's some confusion because of a language change in the, the note accompanying the rule on this. But the rule has not changed. It's the two players who are involved in the held ball, jump ball situation, not the original jumpers. There's been no change, National Federation of High School Basketball rules. So in this instance, where the officials ruled that A5 and B5 would be the jumpers, were the officials correct, yes or no? Indeed. Indeed, they were. That is the correct ruling on this play. There has been no change. National Federation of High School Basketball rules. The players involved in the previous action, meaning the A5 and B5 holding the basketball, will be our jumpers in this scenario. All right. How about one more jump ball play? Let's go. As the referee is preparing to enter the circle for a jump ball, they notice that B2 is standing in front of A2 near the free throw line. The referee instructs the two players to stand side by side. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? To me, this is probably the most common misunderstanding about jump ball rules and restrictions. And I don't know if it came from far off times where the rules were different, but of course, players who are not on the center restraining circle, as we've discussed previously, the center restraining circle is three feet from within three feet of that center restraining circle. These players are at the free throw line. They are far away from the center restraining circle. Understanding that those players have no restrictions. Oftentimes when we enter the circle and we feel like we're getting started in the game, we want to get things started right, etc. We don't want to miss anything. and we're, we're, our, our energy may be misdirected and we think, 
No, no. You everybody on the court has to be side by side. Just understand these players have no restrictions. They could be doing a little do -si do together with their arms interlocked, moving in circles, uh, you know, repositioning on each other. They don't have to be stationary. There's no restriction on their positioning on the court. Critical to know that in order to get plays right. So in this instance, where the officials told, instructed those players who had no restrictions on their uh, position on the court, that they must change their position to become some sense of legal. Uh, in, were they correct, yes or no? No, no, they were not correct. This is incorrect. Does it have a big impact on the game? No, no, it doesn't. But it is incorrect by rule. Hey, I've got a tremendous group of show supporters, and I'd like to give a huge shout out to them. The show supporter big board today features Greg Becker, Bob Lloyd, Andrew Spigner, Randy Wilson, and Richard McGuire. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show, we'll always have a link down in the show notes below, and you know I'm going to do it. I'm going to put a link above. Awesome. All right, let's move on now to our very next play scenario. A1 is at the free throw line for the first of a one and one. While performing her habitual dribbles prior to the release, she accidentally allows the ball to deflect off of her foot into the lane where it rolls into the leg of B3 in a marked lane space. The officials sound a whistle and rule a free throw violation on A1. Play will resume with an AP throw in on the end line. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Okay, got to think this one through, right? It's the first of a one and one. Player inadvertently dribbles the ball, bounces off of her foot. Just like an interrupted dribble within the game, she has lost control and no longer has the ball. The ball is rolled into the lane. The officials rule this to be a throw, a free throw violation. Are they correct in that? And are we adjudicating properly? If it is a, throw in, a, free, a free throw violation, what happens next, right? It's the first of a one and one If we have a violation by the, the, the throwing team, the shooting team here, the free throw will have ended. How would the game be resumed, right? So we have to determine that as well. So by rule, this is a free throw violation for the thrower losing control of the ball, being unable to retrieve it. They would have to, you know, step out. If they had just lost the ball a couple of feet in front, they may be able to retrieve it and they'd still be under the restriction to release the throw within 10 seconds. But in this instance, since it's out of their reach, um, they do not have that option and it is a violation. So in this instance, our thrower has violated. What's the penalty for a thrower violating? Ball to the opponent at the spot nearest the violation. That's the penalty. In this instance, there are no subsequent free throws, so that violation would yield a throw-in to the opponent nearest to the spot. So in this instance, where the officials ruled an AP throw-in should result, were the officials correct, yes or no? No. No, they were not. Some officials get this wrong. Some officials, when they see this rules question. And this crew got it wrong. The result would be an, a throw-in by Team B at the spot nearest the foul on the end line. Designated spot throw-in. And that is the way it's going to go on that one. All right, let's move along to our next free throw scenario. Prior to A1's two free throws following a tactical foul, the Team B coach tells their five players to stand directly behind the thrower and behind the three-point line. The officials instruct the players to move back to the division line. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? This is a common misconception that officials have. You see it often. 
And the impact of that misconception leads uh, the stakeholders in the game, since they've had been instructed in the past, to naturally go to the division line, feeling that that is the obligation of those players. Just like in the jump ball situation we had earlier, understanding which players have restrictions on their location or their movement and what those restrictions are. If you are, a, if you are not the thrower and you are not a player in a designated, uh, a marked lane space, then your obligation is to be behind the three-point arc and above the free throw line extended. And that is your only obligation. There's no obligation in this situation for players to be at the division line or be not be at the far end line or what have you. They are perfectly entitled to that spot on the floor in this instance. Just understand that players who are not the thrower and not in marked lane spaces, what are the restrictions on those players? If we know that, then things get really easy. Outside the three-point arc and above the free throw line extended. Simple. Simple and straightforward. So in this instance, rather than uh, do that, the officials erroneously instructed our players that they must be at the division line for these technical foul free throws, and our officials were not correct in this situation. All right, let's take a look at another free throw scenario. A1 is shooting the first of a one and one bonus. A4 and A5 are positioned in the first two marked lane spaces near the end line. And B4 and B5 are positioned in the second two marked lane spaces. The incorrect alignment is recognized by the officials just after the successful try goes through the basket. The officials rule a simultaneous violation and disallow the goal. Play will resume with an AP throw-in on the end line. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Hmm. Okay, what do we have here? We have an incorrect alignment. Uh, of course, during free throws... We are always at tendency from, to uh, disconnect from the game, to take a little moment for ourselves uh, because there's not much going on. There's basically only one player playing basketball. Our thrower is going to try on the, in, the, on, in this situation. We relax. Players go to spots on lane, marked lane spaces. We're not paying attention. They are in the wrong spaces for whatever reason, right? They ended up there and... Um, this is illegal by rule and would potentially make this a simultaneous violation, canceling the free throw. But it's important to understand when does, this is one of the three restarts in the game of basketball, when does the restart start and when does the restart end? In this instance, when we have a thrower, we bounce the ball to the thrower. They catch the ball. The ball has become live. The free throw has started. When does the free throw end? In, it ends with a, the ball becoming dead. It ends with the ball passing through the basket. Or it ends when the try is obviously not going to be successful. So on this play, in this situation, by rule... The, f the free throw has ended when the ball passed through the goal. And since the free throw had ended, our ability to assess a violation has ended as well. So in this instance, while if we had recognized when the ball was alive at the disposal of the thrower, that the teams were, it were uh, aligned incorrectly, then we can rule a simultaneous violation. The ball is in flight we can rule a simultaneous violation. But once the ball passes through, the free throw and the free throw restrictions have ended and our ability to make a ruling of a simultaneous violation has ended as well. So in this instance where the officials after the goal had been scored 
ruled as simultaneous violations were the officials correct in this instance? No. No, they were not. Right? We've made a mistake, but our ability to correct, the, the window for correction has passed in this situation. Let's take a look at our next play scenario. A1 is at the free throw line to attempt a final free throw. Just prior to the release, the ball slips in A1's hands slightly and they stop their attempt. B3, in a marked lane space, steps into the lane. Opponent steps into the lane. The officials rule a delayed violation on B3. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Okay, players at the line, right? Pre-shot routine, doing all this stuff. They go uh, to begin their attempt, and the ball slips slightly in their hands. And they stop their attempt. The opponent in a marked lane space, anticipating the release, right? These players are all sort of at the starting line. They're trying to anticipate the timing of the release so that they can compete for the rebound in this situation. This is the final free throw attempt. So everybody on the lane is usually, you know, high energy in that situation, right? And they, they step into the lane, but the player has not completed their motion. They have essentially fooled that player in a marked lane space to into violating, right? So what is our ruling on this play? That's We know that a thrower is not allowed to intentionally fake a free throw. And, and achieve that same reaction of the player anticipating their release and stepping into the lane, right? They're not allowed to fake, but has this player faked or has this player taken an action that was involuntary and the, the result was that the player violated? So this is a you know, relatively unique scenario, but it's important to understand here that the liability for not violating in this instance does rely, does lie with the player in the marked lane space. They are responsible to ensure that the thrower has released the try before they enter. Um, as unfair as it may be in this situation, our correct ruling would involve a delayed violation. Of course, this uh, allows the free throw to continue. The result of the free throw will determine what happens next. If the ball is, if the throw is successful, if the try is successful, rather, the result will be an inline throw in. If the try is unsuccessful, a replacement free throw would be awarded. So in this instance where the officials did have a delayed lane violation as their ruling, were the officials correct? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, they were. That would be the correct ruling in this instance. Unfair as it may seem to B3, right? They did everything right, but our, our guidance uh, per rule is delayed violation because in I this can. instance. Hey, I'm really fortunate myself to have an elite production team working with me. Gus and Oliver. Go Time Productions, producing high quality video content so that we have a tremendous show for you. You may not be as fortunate and have that elite production team. So what I can recommend is trying Ecamm Live, the number one live streaming software for Mac. I will put a link to a 14 day free trial in the show description below. Enhance your Zoom calls, your meetings, etc., with high quality video production. And you can do that with Ecamm Live. All right, let's move on now to some different play scenarios. Let's take a look at our next one. During a throw in after a scored goal, A1 picks up the ball, steps out of bounds turns, and then fumbles the ball inbounds so that it bounces on the court. A1 then quickly recovers the ball while they are still standing out of bounds. A1 then, A1 then passes the ball to A2, standing inbounds. The officials rule a throw-in violation. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Well, the player picked up the ball, stepped out of bounds, turned to make a throw-in, 
lost control of the ball. It bounced once on the court, but they retrieved it and then released a throw and pass. Right? That's legal, right? What's the what's what have they done wrong? Right? That's the question on this play. Understanding thrower restrictions is critical to adjudicating throw in plays. Now, what do we know about throw in plays? Throw in plays of the three restarts in the game of basketball, jump ball occurs wildly infrequently, once, maybe twice, possibly a third time in a game, very infrequent. Free throws are very static, right? Nobody's moving. One player is taking action, right? Those are free throws. Now, throw-ins. Throw-ins, there's a, a frenzy of activity. There's high energy in throw-in situations. And you will see wild things occur during throw-ins that you didn't anticipate. There's a lot going on. Really, understanding throw-in restrictions is a high bang-for-your-buck scenario. Understanding throw-in restrictions. I will put a link to a full playlist on throw-in rules and restrictions, National Federation of High School Basketball Rules. If we understand that what we're looking for, what is illegal, then we are in a great position as officials to adjudicate plays properly. So on this, on this play, in this situation, the thrower, the throw-in has begun when the player stepped out of bounds, turned, right? We would expect a count by the official. Once the throw-in begins, there are restrictions on throwers. They may not, they may release the ball onto the court, which occurred on this play, but they cannot then be the first to touch as they were on this play. Thrower, there's many restrictions. They cannot carry the ball onto the court, meaning they cannot step onto the court in a throw-in situation. Can they step on the line? Yes, because the line is out of bounds. The court is in bounds. So these are the things that we have to know. So in this instance where the officials ruled a throw-in violation, were the officials correct? Yes or no? Indeed. Indeed they were. This is a correct ruling on this play. This is a throw-in violation by rule. Let's take a look at our very next throw-in play scenario. During an alternating possession throw-in after the ball is released by A1, B2 intentionally extends a leg and deflects the basketball. The officials rule a kicking violation and resume with an alternating possession throw-in. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? All right, so we have a held ball. Got a held ball ruling on the court. We're going to have an alternating possession throw in for team A. They're looking for somebody to throw to. They release the throw in pass. Defensive player extends a leg and contacts the ball. Didn't contact their foot. It contacted their leg. And a kicking violation is ruled. Is that the correct ruling in this play? Of course. Right? You cannot play the ball with your leg or your feet. Um, so we have a correct ruling on the play. But what happens next? Right? And this brings up some really important points that I'd like to discuss. Right, So in our scenario here, we have an alternating possession throw in and then a violation by the defensive team. What is the penalty for that violation? If a, if a team kicks the ball, what's the penalty? How do we proceed? We award the ball to the opponent at the spot nearest the violation. Right. So our resulting throw in in this situation is no longer an alternating possession throw in. It is a throw in related to the violation itself. What happens to the arrow? Does the arrow change? Understanding when the alternating possession arrow is switched. It's simple, but when does when does it switch? Right. It's switched when a throw in ends. And that's what we have to know. Did our throw-in end in this situation? The throw, when does a throw-in end by rule? It ends in one of three ways. It ends if the throwing team violates. It ends if it is touched by a player, legally touched by a player inbounds. 
or touched by a player out of bounds. Did one of those three, three things occur in this situation? No. No, it did not. So there would be no switch of the arrow, and the resulting throw-in, we know, is as a result of the violation and is no longer an alternating possession throw-in. Go back. So in this instance where the officials ruled that we would have an alternating possession throw-in after the kickball violation was ruled, were our officials correct in this instance? No. No, they were not. But we have to understand in this situation that the resulting throw-in is as a result of the violation, and the alternating possession throw-in never ended. Therefore, the arrow would not be switched in this situation. One thing we can expect in this situation is that there's going to be confusion. There's going to be confusion at the table. We need to, may need to emphasize uh, to our table personnel that we are not using the arrow on this throw-in um, in this situation if we adjudicate it properly. And we are in great position for our next play scenario. During a designated spot throw-in, A1 fumbles the ball that rolls several feet away. A1 leaves the designated spot, retrieves the ball, returns to the original throw-in spot, and releases the ball just prior to the five-second count ending. The officials rule this to be a legal play. Were our officials correct? Yes or no? Well, we know that there's thrower restrictions on a designated spot throw-in on all throw-ins. They must complete their throw. They must release the throw-in pass within five seconds. And our player, uh, our thrower, uh, is in a hurry here and, and wants to accomplish that and does, in fact, release the throw-in pass within five seconds. But is their action legal of uh, going to retrieve a ball that they fumble? First of all, can a player legally fumble the ball in this situation and pick it back up? Can a player out of bounds for a designated spot throw and dribble the ball? Can they bounce the ball with two hands? Can they maybe lose control of the ball, pick it back up? All of those things are legal. What is illegal during a designated spot throw-in? Our thrower must maintain one or both feet above the throw-in spot. Okay, we're learning. Rule four, what is a designated spot? Is it a little circle on the floor? No, it's a three-foot wide area that extends from the court back as far as is feasible in that situation. If there's stands there, maybe very little. If there's bench, maybe very little. Um, if there's a wall that's 10 feet back, that player can move 10 feet back as long as they stay above the spot one of their feet above the spot. This player has left our designated spot to retrieve the basketball, has successfully retrieved it and come back, but that is illegal by rule. They have not kept one or both of their feet above that designated spot area. So in this instance, where the officials ruled this to be a legal play, were our officials correct? No. No, they were not. This is a pretty simple violation that we should get each and every time. <clears throat> that player is not allowed to leave that designated spot, retrieve the ball, and return. All right, let's move on to our very next throw-in play. Team A has a non-designated spot throw-in along the end line. A1's long throw-in pass sails over the head of teammate A2 near the sideline in the front court. The officials rule an out-of-bounds violation on Team A and award a throw-in to Team B for a sideline throw-in. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Okay. Thrower has a non-designate. They can move along the end line. They see a teammate down court. They throw a long pass, sails over their head, and uh, contacts the floor on the, near the sideline, let's say in the front court here. Yeah, in the front court. The officials rule this to be an out-of-bounds violation. Ball to the opponent at the spot nearest the out-of-bounds violation. 
Were the officials correct? Yes or no? That's our question on this play, right? Super simple uh, to understand. What are the restrictions on the thrower? They must release a throwing pass onto the court. In this instance, we have failed to achieve that by throwing the ball in a fashion that does not contact a player inbounds or out of bounds in this situation. So if a throw in pass sails over the court in this situation and is not touched by any player, this is actually a throw in violation. Okay, it's not an out of bounds violation, the penalty for which is throw in at the spot of the out of bounds violation. Anytime we have a throw in violation, the throw in spot for the opponent is at the spot of the throw in. So in this instance, where the officials ruled an out-of-bounds violation and a throw-in at the sideline, were our officials correct on this very simple play? No. No, they were not. Sometimes we could be confused, like the, 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 the official who was administering the throw-in, or in this instance was, the, let's say, the trail, is not aware whether the ball was touched or not as it sailed over the head. We would expect information to come from the lead. We may ask, hey, was that touched? In the absence of a touch in this situation, we would have a throw-in violation. All right, moving on. Another throw-in play. Let's go. After a made basket by Team B, Team A is granted a timeout. On the ensuing throw-in, all five Team A players are lined up off the court behind Team B's end line when the official wants to administer the throw-in. The officials allow this configuration and rule that this is legal. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Wow. All right, we're seeing more of this play, right? Understanding the situation is critical here. This is after a made basket. Team requests a timeout. They go and design a play. Maybe this is an end-of-game situation. After a scored goal, what are the restrictions? We know that during a designated spot throw-in, one player is the thrower, and they are at the designated spot, and no other te teammate, no other player can step out of bounds. That's one of the restrictions. But after a scored goal, that restriction does not exist. A, a teammate can step out of bounds, during a non-designated spot throw-in legally. One player can, two players can, three players can. There's no restriction, no requirement after a, a made basket, a scored goal for a non-designated spot throw-in. There's no requirement that players need to be on the court. So in this instance, the officials ruled this to be a legal configuration. Like I say, we're seeing more of this as teams uh, imitate plays from, from other levels. In this instance where the officials ruled this to be a legal play, were the officials correct? Yes or no? Yes. It is legal because there is no restriction against those players being out of bounds during a non-designated spot throw-in. What are the restrictions? This team could pass the ball between each other, right? They can go one end to the other, but the main restriction is that our throw-in has to be released within five seconds. Hey, thanks for joining us today for the Basketball Rules Expert. Before we go, allow me to thank our tremendous show supporters that fuel our broadcast. <laughs> Greg Becker, Bob Lloyd, Andrew Spigner, Randy Wilson, and Richard McGuire. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show? I'm always going to have a link down in the show notes below. And as usual, I will put one. Where am I going to put it? Am I going to put it over here? Over here? No, I'm going to put it right here. Hey, I have additional video content available here. There's a master class on throw-ins, rules and restrictions, master class 
free throws, rules, and restrictions. Make your choice. Choose wisely. We'll see you then in the very next video. Take care.